Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Friday Evening Bible Study. It's hard to believe we're into March already, March 1st here today. So just tonight and then next Friday night uh, in this season of Bible studies, and then we'll take a break. Uh, we've certainly got to get ready for Adventure Camp, Teen Camp, uh, this upcoming Spring Holy Days and other things. So uh, we'll pick it up again in the fall. Once the time changes, uh, we'll jump back into these Bible studies. We've covered so much uh, in the Bible study so far. This is lecture 31 on the epistles of Paul here tonight. Um, I think we'll keep it uh, around under 60. Uh, we're, we're really covered a, a lot of ground. I realize uh, we've not covered quite half of the epistles of Paul, uh, but many of the books we have yet to cover are shorter, like the one we'll be in tonight, and it'll go faster uh, because it's just less material. Tonight we're jumping into Philippians. Uh, and tonight I want to do a short introduction to the book or to the epistle or the letter. And then um, we'll get in, into chapter 1 and 2 and we'll see if we can't get through both those chapters. And then next week we'll do chapters 3 and 4. And that'll finish up this epistle as well. Uh, we'll see how far we get. I have more notes than I've ever had for a Bible study like this. So let's see how far we can go. Uh, first of all, uh, church tradition unanimously agrees with the statement in Philippians 1.1 that Paul wrote this epistle. Uh, Paul's letter or his epistle here to the Philippians is a testimony of the positive attitude that Paul had even though he was in prison when he wrote this and facing a very uncertain future. Uh, Paul's suffering and his trials had taught him to be content in any circumstance. And he's certainly an example for us to follow in that respect. Uh, the fact that Paul wrote uh, this thank you letter to the Philippians expresses his joy in what God was accomplishing through them. This is um, one of my favorite uh, epistles uh, of Paul. Uh, the fact that Paul wrote this uh, again uh, from Rome while he was under house arrest is significant. Uh, this epistle was written in approximately 61 AD. Um, people date it 60 to 62, but 61 is what we were taught in college, and I think that's, that's as accurate as we can uh, place it. And once again, I don't get too buggy about exact dates. You know, we're going to find out someday exactly. Was it the spring, the fall? Uh, when was it completed? When was it delivered? Uh, this is our best uh, estimate based on the facts that we have. Um, so again, this is one of Paul's prison epistles is what they're called. Uh, this letter was likely taken by the hand of Epaphroditus. Uh, Philippians 2.25 uh, indicates that. Uh, and although the distance here between Rome, and that's where Paul was in prison and under house arrest and in chains, <laughs> bound to a, a soldier, um, the distance between Rome where Paul was and Philippi is, is quite a great distance. Um, Paul was in Rome long enough, however, for the messages to travel back and forth to Philippi and back to Rome or from Rome to Philippi. Uh, because his situation allowed him some freedom to preach the gospel, he felt confident that his release uh, from prison was imminent. He was uncertain of that, but he felt uh, or at least had hope that that would happen. Now, Paul wrote for several reasons. Uh, one was to encourage the Philippians to grow in love and to add knowledge and, and wisdom, and also to encourage them to serve without vanity and to avoid false teachers once again. Uh, Philippi was a city that was strategically located on a major road, uh, the Ignatian Way, and it connected the eastern provinces of the Roman Empire to Rome, and it became one of the leading cities, um, in fact, the leading city in Macedonia. Uh, in 42 BC, the Romans granted Philippi the highest status possible for a provincial city, uh, the status of a Roman colony. And this means that the citizens of Philippi could purchase, they could own, uh, they could transfer property. And they were also exempt from poll taxes and land taxes. 
In Paul's time, uh, Philippi uh, as a Roman colony was heavily populated by retired soldiers of the Roman army. We see that in Acts 16, verse 12. Uh, there were a few Jews in the city as well, um, and that's uh, noted by the fact that uh, the city did not have a synagogue. There was only a few, uh, and we see that in Acts 16, 13. Uh, Philippi originally was a, uh, a mining center. It was founded because it was a mining center. They processed gold and silver, uh, and those reserves were nearby. Uh, Philippi was the first European city visited by the apostle, and he arrived likely on Pentecost 50 AD, uh, and he was directed by a vision that he had received in Troas uh, to go there. We read that in Acts 16, 9 through 13. So that's just a little background to the book. Of course, we could spend a whole lecture on background. We just simply don't have a time uh, we want to get to the material. That's really at the heart and soul of what's important uh, here anyway. But that gives you a background. Uh, in the first few verses here, we see that Paul reveals his great love for the Philippians. And he, he says that he thinks about them often. He says that he's concerned about them and that he regularly prays for them. Uh, Paul, uh, let's start here. Paul and Timothy, verse 1, servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops and deacons. So servants here, you could write bond servants in your margin or slaves uh, in the Greek. Saints, that refers to all believers. You and I are saints. If we're uh, following God's righteous commands and trying to live his way, uh, that's what the Bible, uh, how the Bible defines what a saint is, uh, not what some other churches define one as. Uh, bishops are simply overseers in the Greek. Uh, they're synonymous with elders. And deacons are, ch are charged with handling the physical and material needs of the church. In Acts 6, 1 through 7, it, it shows the roles of a deacon. Um, this verse speaks of bishops or elders and deacons, which shows that the church was organized, that it, was, it had enough people to have structure and organization. It wasn't just three or four people in a home. Um, verse 2 says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Uh, Paul said that every time the Philippians came to mind, he thanked God for them. Uh, they, were, they were very helpful in his ministry. Verse 4, Always in every prayer of mine making requests for you all with joy. It's interesting, in this epistle alone, Paul uses the word joy five times. And the Greek word for rejoice nine times. And so he talks a lot about joy and rejoicing uh, here in this particular letter. It says, uh, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. A fellowship here means communication. It means distribution. It can also mean contribution. So the general meaning here is that they all shared a common interest and belief in the gospel and they were eager to support the preaching of the gospel and to minister to the needs of those who were appointed to preach it. And Paul was one of them. And we see that the Philippians, as we read this epistle, sent a gift or a contribution to Paul who was in prison to, you know, cover his needs. And uh, Epaphroditus was the one uh, that was sent by the Philippians to bring this gift to Paul. And Paul says from the first day until now, because Paul knew them from the very beginning, because he'd been used by God to raise up the church in Philippi. He founded it. Verse 6, being confident in this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. So Paul was confident. In other words, he was fully persuaded. He was convinced regarding the 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 truth of what he preached. He had no doubt on the subject. And he he also was clear to them that, look, God isn't just going to abandon you. Uh, God never gives up on you. He never gives up on us. He never leaves us or forsakes us. Uh, Hebrews 13, 5 uh, tells us that. It says, I will never leave you or forsake you. Um, some, by the way, uh, just say this by uh, point of interest. I saw it in my notes from college. Some in the Church of God used this verse back in the day to say that Mr. Armstrong would never die and that God would finish the work through him. 
and that he would be alive when Christ returned and doing the work. Uh, and so we can't um, add to Scripture. We can't, uh, you know, we should avoid uh, making these kind of predictions when we, we don't have the facts. Now, does his work outlast him? Yes, we have the HWA library. We have the information. We have the truth. It's People are still reading it. It's still being very effective. Over 6 million people go to that library and read that stuff. Uh, every month. Uh, it's it's living on, but he physically is not here. He didn't see the work to the very end. He was used powerfully by God in the Philadelphian era of God's church to, to reach the world with the gospel message. Verse 7, uh, and again, it says, until the day of Christ, you know, it expresses that we keep pressing toward the goal. Uh, the Bible says it's kind of like a relay race, one era to the next. And the time is, is coming when God's faithful people will be born into his divine family and he will complete the work that he has begun in us. Verse 7, just as it is right for me to think this of you all because I have you in my heart inasmuch both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are all partakers with me of grace. So Paul here is warmly attached to the brethren. The brethren are warmly attached to Paul. That's really what God wants it to be like. It's not always that way, but that's the way it should be in the church of God. And Paul was in chains. He was a prisoner. Um, and while he was in chains, the Philippians, again, took care of his needs. And, and Paul, where it says in defense of the gospel, that implies speech. Uh, by speech, he defended it. And, and Paul was not silent when he was in prison. He boldly preached the gospel. And we'll see that as we go through this epistle. When it says in confirmation, and that means a validating guarantee. Uh, you are all partakers with me of grace. And so what does he mean by that? They had participated with him in the defense of the gospel. They'd supported him financially. They'd supported him in their prayers. Um, they had suffered persecution just as he had. And it followed that they would also share with Paul in God's grace or divine favor. They'd be blessed for what they did. Um, Paul defended the gospel against the opponent's attacks, and he confirmed the gospel through powerful signs and, and miracles and, and things that uh, God did through him. Verse 8, for God is my witness, how greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. So here Paul again speaks of his deep affection and his feelings for the Philippian brethren. And his feelings for them, he said, were like Christ's feelings for them who lived in and who died for them. Verse 9, and this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and in all discernment. Paul felt that the Philippians needed to be more loving to one another. They had certainly showed him love. Um, and, you know, it's something we all need to work on. Uh, remember the verse, uh, John um, 13, 35, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. And uh, Paul felt this uh, was important. Uh, we all need to work on that. Nothing by the way, will promote our welfare like this, uh, having that kind of love. Love is so important. God is love. It's the very essence of his character. He talks about knowledge. He wished them to have intelligent affection, it says in many translations. In other words, it should not be blind affection, but it should be love based on the truth. And discernment implies perception or insight, uh, spiritual perceptiveness, we could say. So verse 10, it says that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. The word for approve here means to test in the Greek. And the verb is used in ancient literature for the testing of gold to determine its purity and the quality of it. It's also used for trying oxen to assess their usefulness. Like hitch them up, let's see how good these oxen are and how much they pull and work. So they were to test whether things were true and genuine. They were to distinguish between right and wrong, good and evil. And he would not have them just love and approve of all things indiscriminately. So you've got to 
do this. Again, wisdom, knowledge are important. And he talks about being sincere. What does it mean to be sincere? It means to be pure. It means to be unmixed, uh, to be free of falsehood. So it also literally means, in this case, to be judged by sunlight. What, what is that? Well, any spot in a garment, for instance, or any imperfection in, the, in a, a piece of merchandise could be seen if you simply held the object up to the sunlight. And as Christians, he said we should strive to be without spot or blemish and, and again, to be our beliefs and, and, and our character should be sincere. It should be pure. And he says, without, without offense. Um, the phrase means that we don't lead others um, into sin by our own behavior and, and cause offense, cause them to stumble. Until the day of Christ, um, some days coming, right, yet ahead, where we'll stand before Jesus Christ and he will judge our character. Uh, he is a faithful and true witness and God the Father has appointed him as a judge. So what we do now matters. Verse 11, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Now, what are the fruits of righteousness? They are the fruits characterized by righteous conduct or behavior. And that's our our righteous fruits should be born. Um, and of course, God works in and through us to develop our character, but we have a role to play. We have to yield to God's lead and the lead of his Holy Spirit and, and get in line and do the things that he says, be, be obedient. Verse 12, but I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. Paul wanted the Philippians to know that his imprisonment was actually advancing, not hindering, but advancing the preaching of the gospel. And those kind of words to the Philippians would have been comforting. They were concerned about Paul. They were concerned about his welfare. They needed assurance that their prayers for Paul and that their gifts to Paul were getting to him and that they had not been in vain. Verse 13, so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and all the rest that my chains are in Christ. So Paul's imprisonment here furthered the, the preaching of the gospel in, in a couple ways. First, the palace guard heard it. And secondly, he says, all the rest. There were visitors that heard the gospel from Paul. Uh, some of those visitors were Jewish leaders that were in Rome. We see that in Acts 28, 17. The palace guard, who were they? they? They were the Praetorian Guard. And they consisted of several thousand highly trained elite soldiers of the Roman Empire who were headquartered at Rome. So during the two years that Paul had been under house arrest in Rome, different soldiers had taken different turns guarding him. And because they were literally chained to Paul, they had no other choice but to listen to Paul. And and he proclaimed the gospel to them. Uh, so Paul considered his imprisonment to be the result of God's sovereign will. And he used the opportunity to reach people that may not have been reached any other way. Verse 14, it says, And most of the brethren of the Lord, having become confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. So, Although they too could end up being imprisoned like Paul was, the brethren were emboldened by Paul's courage. Uh, they were not afraid to speak the word without fear. Uh, they saw how Paul kept going, even though he was under trials, even though he was bound in chains and under house arrest. And they did not deny Christ. You know, we, we could deny Christ. We, we, we can be embarrassed about what we believe in. And people ask us a question like, why don't you keep Christmas? And we can dodge that or we can give them a simple answer. And always we should give an answer to the hope that lies within us. We should do that kindly and we shouldn't give them the one hour speech unless that's what they're, they're asking for. Uh, give a simple answer. It can be as simple as you walk through the line and, and somebody says, you know, happy Halloween. And you go, have a nice day. Thank you. And, and wait, do you not believe or do you not keep Halloween? I said, no. I don't either. Now, why don't you do that? And you give them a short answer. Now, you never know. I, I've had guys I work with that I end up giving booklets to. They keep asking them, like, here, read the booklet 
It explains it fully. If you have more questions, I'm happy to help. So they weren't embarrassed. They saw a bold call, uh, Paul was. Paul's locked up. He's in prison. They could end up in prison because they believe and, and talk like Paul does. Uh, again, 1 Peter 3.15, uh, Peter was inspired to write, always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Again, we don't, the, the other side of that is we don't try to convince our neighbors and our friends and drive our religion down their throats. Uh, that God calls people. We let him do it. We simply give answers to those that ask, and we're not afraid to say what we believe uh, when asked. Some indeed preach Christ, verse 15, even from envy and strife, and some also from goodwill. So Paul had a conundrum here. Uh, even though uh, some of these preachers uh, preach from uh, the true gospel, right? They, they still preach the correct things. But they were envious uh, of Paul and his success uh, and his reputation and his esteem. Uh, and they wanted to have that kind of esteem, that kind of reputation. They were a bit envious. And now that Paul was in bonds and he's in prison, they saw an opportunity to preach as Paul had preached, hoping that they'd meet with the same success. Now, they didn't. And they sought to transfer to themselves the honor, the respect, the applause uh, that caused this strife and dissension. Uh, again, they didn't do it from the right perspective. They did it from envy and strife from that perspective. And yet they did preach the truth because otherwise Paul wouldn't have said what he said in the verses that follow. Others preached the truth from goodwill. So some of the preachers that taught thought well of Paul, and they preached the gospel with good motives and carried on because uh, he was locked up. We got to carry on out here. It says, the former preached Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely supposing to add affliction to my chains. So they did not preach to honor God or to help Paul, but rather gain applause and followers for themselves. We see it in the world today. We see it in the church today. Not sincerely. They were not acting with pure motives. Uh, supposing to add affliction to my chains. They were trying to turn others against Paul and make his trial even greater, actually. Uh, they undermined him. It says, but the latter, out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. So those from goodwill preach from pure motives and from sincere affection to him. And Paul was appointed to be the defender of the gospel. And these preachers were convinced of that. And they went forth to promote and defend the truth as well. So again, we have two different kind of preachers that were, you know, standing up and preaching and teaching. Uh, one with the right uh, motives and the others with bad motives. And Paul says in verse 18, What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And in this I rejoice, yes, and will rejoice. So what does this mean? Paul, in effect, was saying what? What then? Whether their preaching was done for false motives or pure motives, Paul was just glad the gospel was being preached. Either way, it was spreading. The chief error of those who preached from selfish ambition was their self-seeking, envious motives, not so much the error of doctrine, Again, had there been a vital error in doctrine, Paul would not have rejoiced and he would not have approved of it. Uh, Paul could rejoice at the good result in spite of their bad intentions is what's happening here. Verse 19, For I know that this will turn out for my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. So Paul here expresses a positive attitude. He, he had a knack for being positive in tough situations. And even though his detractors here attempted to produce something unpleasant for Paul, he believed it would end up producing something good. The preaching of these men, though they desired to hurt the apostle, would be useful in the conversion of many. It was a matter of rejoicing for Paul. It's amazing that he, he, he could have that kind of positive attitude. It says, through your prayer, Paul sought their prayers. And we sometimes need to seek the prayers of the brethren. Uh, he sought those as a means of support. And Paul knew what we know. 
The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. James uh, 5.16 He talks about the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Paul needed a supply of the same Spirit Jesus Christ had that enabled Christ to bear his trials with patience. Paul said, I need that. I need a supply of that. Uh, he needed God's Spirit to sustain him and to cause good to come from all the trials he was going through. Verse 20, it says, According to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. He talks about earnest expectation. Whatever the crisis might be, Paul looked to that crisis eagerly. And he did it in hope. Hope is a confident expectation. He, he had hope. Hope is so important. All of us have to have hope. If we lose our hope, um, God says in, in Proverbs, hope deferred makes the heart sick. Uh, we have the hope of the resurrection. We have the hope that Christ will return soon and establish his kingdom. That gives us strength to carry on. And Paul says that in nothing I shall be ashamed. So he uses this phrase here. He also uses the same phrase elsewhere. And it refers to the shame that comes from hopes disappointed or professions unfulfilled. So you profess to do something, you fulfill it. If you have hope, you know, you hang in there and, and you realize that hope. So Paul trusted in his hour of trial, the confidence that he has felt and professed of being made, able to do all things through Christ who strengthens him. Uh, Philippians 4.13, we'll get to that. Uh, may not come to a shameful failure. Uh, that it might rather be used as an occasion to magnify Christ. And if we can look at the trials that we go through and the difficulties in life in that way, God is very pleased with that. And it magnifies Christ. The glory goes to God. Uh, Paul didn't embarrass or shame uh, the uh, God that, that he worshipped and served, and neither should we. Uh, Paul said, with all boldness. Uh, Paul was that way. He spoke the truth. He did it boldly. He did it courageously. And when it talks about Christ being magnified in my body, he looked to God's spirit within him to magnify Christ in him. And what mattered to Paul was not his own glory, not his own praise, not his own honor. What mattered was that, it was that Christ was magnified, that Christ was glorified and exalted. Uh, he had a totally different attitude than those who did this out of envy and strife. He says, whether by life, if Paul was permitted to live, he would continue to be a living sacrifice. He, he was not certain how his case would turn out. Didn't know if his trial would result in his acquittal or his uh, condemnation. Um, so he says, or by death, if this trial results in death, Paul was not afraid to die. Uh, Paul was persuaded that he would be able to bear the pain of his death in such a way as to honor Christ. And, and that's an amazing thing. If we can go, as many martyrs have throughout history, uh, go through that painful experience of being tortured or even killed in such a way that we give honor to Christ, uh, God looks favorably on that. Uh, we can't be cowards. We can't cave to pressure. We can't recant our beliefs. Uh, how many people have done that through history? Probably a whole lot more than stood their ground. Uh, Paul, whether it's life or death, didn't matter. In fact, sometimes Paul goes, you know, it, it's the easy path here is for me to go to sleep. Notice what he says in verse 21. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. As far as I'm concerned, Paul says, to live is Christ. Whatever life, whatever time, whatever strength I have left, are Christ. Paul's entire goal, his sole aim in living was to imitate Christ, to know Christ, to glorify Christ, to make the gospel known. Uh, his focus was this. It was the work of God and, and God's way of life. When he said to die is gain, it means profit. It means advantage. Paul knew that if he were martyred, that he would be freed from persecution and suffering and that he would one day be resurrected and join the family of God when Christ returned. And he was confident of that. And, and uh, that gave him hope and strength. 
Uh, Galatians 2.20, I uh, won't have time to turn there, but it talks about being crucified with Christ and uh, it really fits as well. Verse 22, but if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor, yet what I shall choose, I cannot tell. Paul said, look, if I live on in the flesh, uh, my purpose will be to bring forth more fruit from my ministry. So Paul would have the opportunity, if he lived, to continue to preach the gospel to others and to strengthen uh, the brethren there in Philippi. He says in verse 23, For I am hard-pressed between the two, having a desire to depart be to be with Christ, which is far better. So again, the only reason that Paul at this point chose to live, it was it could be a means of benefiting other people and helping them on this path to the kingdom. Now, it's interesting that the Protestants will turn to this verse, verse 22, and use it to say that at death we go to heaven. Uh, they're mistaken. That's not what it says. And we always have to take the word of God as a whole, let the Bible interpret itself, right? Here a little, there a little, line upon line, precept upon precept. John 3.13, one of those key verses, I always use it in every memorial service I ever do or funeral service I ever do. It says, no one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the son of man who is in heaven. And we know in Acts 2.34 that David did not ascend into the heavens. He's dead, he's buried, he's in the ground, he's awaiting the resurrection. And yet the Bible says he'll be king over Israel in the millennium. All the Israelite nations, David is the king. And the apostles have one of those uh, tribes each that they're responsible for. But where is David? He's dead and he's in the ground. He's awaiting a resurrection. And we know that the dead know not anything. Like they're, they're dead. The Bible says they're asleep. And uh, they don't know anything. They sleep the sleep of death and will someday be resurrected and, and brought back to life. Uh, again, we can't cut out those verses and many others. Uh, that talk about this. I mean, why even have a resurrection if you just die and immediately go to heaven or hell anyway? It doesn't make sense. It says in verse 24, Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. And Paul says, look, you know, for me, the easy path is death and, and I'll be in the kingdom. Uh, and I've got to forego that so I can be of continued service to the brethren. And for their sake, he was willing to live a little bit longer. And being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith. So Paul felt pretty strongly that he would continue to teach them, that he would help them grow spiritually and to mature as Christians, and that, you know, he may be released so he could do that. Verse 26, that your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Christ Jesus by my coming to you again. And the only way he would have been able to come to them is if they let him out of prison. And then uh, they would rejoice because he was set free. He was acquitted. And he would be happy to see them uh, if God permitted that. Verse 27, only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. So let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. It really refers to our whole way of life. It means literally to let our citizenship be worthy of the kingdom that we represent. And again, remember a lot of uh, the people in Philippi were granted citizenship. That was a Roman colony. So it fits well with what we're talking about. Uh, we live in this world, but we are citizens of another, right? We, we Our conduct and the way we act should represent uh, that kingdom, that citizenship. He talks about striving together. And literally, when you look at the Greek word, it means to engage together in an athletic contest. Paul often referred to athletic contests. It might be boxing. It might be, you know, the um, a race uh, in the Olympics or, or whatever, uh, or different games. Um, so literally to engage together in an athletic context. So a teamwork is a concept expressed in the Greek here. And Paul was saying, you know, strive together. Don't just strive as individuals, strive as a group. This is a team effort. And uh, he talks about that here in verse 27. It says, and not 
in any way terrified by your adversaries, which is to them a proof of perdition, but to you of salvation and that from God. So what does he mean here? Not in and not in any way terrified. Well, the word terrified here is a strong term, and it's actually used for uh, that of a panicked or a startled horse or, or other animals that are startled. Uh, the Philippians were not to be terrified in the face of their enemies or startled or uh, become like a horse would be if, uh, you know, for instance, it walked up on a rattlesnake and, and panicked or was startled talks about proof of perdition. So the, the Philippines would be living proof, and this is a legal term, uh, denoting proof obtained by an analysis of the facts. Uh, they would be living proof to their opponents that their message was true, that their God was real. And yet their adversaries, their enemies, were doomed to utter destruction, uh, perdition. Uh, but to you, salvation. So this not only refers to temporal safety, but to the ultimate salvation that would be given to them by God. Uh, you know, Luke uh, 12, uh, 32, we read it at the, the Feast of Tabernacles sometimes and, and maybe at other times. But it says, do not fear, little flock, Christ says, for it's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Uh, he wants us to be a part of it. Verse 29, for you it has been granted on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. And the same is true for us. Persecution is a way of life if you're part of God's church, if you're a true Christian. Verse 30, having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here is in me. They have the same strife, the same bitter foes, the same struggle. And it's clearly here, an allusion to Paul's lawless scourging and imprisonment uh, that he experienced in Acts chapter 16, verses 22 to 24. And here Paul's a prisoner in Rome. He's surrounded by his enemies. He's about to be tried for his life. And he said they ought to rejoice if they were called to pass through the same trial. Uh, this is to be your, your focus as a, a true member of God's true church. All right, chapter 2. It says, therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and one mind. So Paul uses a variety of expressions here that really denote the same thing. The object that Paul is aiming at is unity. Unity of heart, they should feel the same way. They, they, unity of plan, unity of purpose. There's probably no single thing that is so much insisted upon in the entire New Testament than the importance of unity and harmony in the church. I mean, it is throughout these verses, throughout these epistles and, and others, the general epistles, etc., uh, it is so important to God. He, he wants unity. And as humans, we don't always agree on everything, but can we still move together in unity? Can we, look, I don't agree with you. You don't agree with me. We'll have to wait and see. Um, and, but let's, let's, let's work together for the common goal. And uh, someday Christ will be here and we can ask the question. He'll give us the answer and God, solve that. I was wrong. Sorry. Away we go. Uh, fix it. So Paul, again, strongly emphasizes unity that should exist between uh, those in the church. Uh, and certainly um, we should have unity as far as our beliefs and single-mindedly strive together to advance the gospel, the witness message, and the truth that we read about this word of God. It says, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. We now get into a section that we often read at Passover. Uh, he talks about a desire to honor oneself or to attract attention, to win the praise to yourself, to make ourselves uppermost and foremost is, is something we should not do. That's selfish ambition. Uh, it shouldn't be that way. That's uh, selfishness, uh, he said, or conceit, which is empty pride. Uh, pride should never be our motive as true Christians. Rather, in lowliness of mind, this, this suggests a deep sense of humility, 
Let each esteem others better than himself. So a humble man will wish that others should be preferred in, in office and in honor uh, above themselves. Like they, they're, they're fine with that. Um, I think of 1 Corinthians 13, which talks about love, uh, verses 4 and 5. 1 Corinthians 13 it says, Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It's not puffed up does not behave rudely, doesn't seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil. So are we concerned more about the physical and spiritual well, well, welfare of other people? And do we practice servant leadership? That's what Christ wants us to do. He came not to be served, but to serve. And we have to have that same approach. Verse 4, let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interests of others. In other words, don't be selfish. Our care and attention, Paul's saying here, must not be entirely absorbed on our own concerns and the concerns of our own family. Okay, our family's important. We're important. It's not that a man should not take care of his self and his, provide for his family. In fact, if he doesn't do that, he's denied the faith and is worse than the infidel, the Bible says, or an unbeliever uh, in 1 Timothy 5.8. Uh, he should be concerned about those things, yet he should also be concerned about the welfare of other people and seek to do them good. And one of the things we all should learn in life is the key to happiness is giving. It's not what we can get, it's what can we give? How can I help? How can we serve? Yeah, God said it was more blessed to give than to receive in Acts 20, 35. Verse 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Right thinking produces right actions, right? Whatever we think about and we dwell upon tends to be what we end up acting uh, upon. And we want to think and act like Jesus Christ. That's a requirement for all of us that have been called. Uh, Christ is willing to give up his Godhead to serve and save others. Do we have that same mindset? Verse 6, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Uh, robbery is something you seize, right? You take. It's not, you know, it's not yours. Jesus in nature is equal with God. He is God. He's, he's there are two members of the God family at the current time, God uh, God, the Father, and His Son, Jesus Christ. Uh, John 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Uh, those verses. Verse 7, it says, But, here's what Christ did, But made Himself of no reputation, taking the form of a servant, and coming in the likeness of men. He made Himself of no reputation. He emptied Himself of His former glory, and God had to become a human. And as a human, he was physically and spiritually strong. Notice what it says. And I want to take a little time here in verse 7. We can't just blast over this. Uh, this is something that is misunderstood sometimes by even people in the church. Uh, and I'm, I'm really quoting here a bit from uh, literature. Uh, and... And I think it's important. So Hebrews 2, let's go there quickly. Verses 17 and 18. It says, Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be, be a merciful and faithful high priest in all things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted he is able to aid those who are tempted. And if we go back to verse 15, it says, For we do not have, this is uh, Hebrews 4, I'm sorry, not 2, Hebrews 4, 15, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. So he came in the form of a servant. The, the word in Greek is bond servant. This is the lowest status on the social ladder, the servant in a, in a household. In the likeness of men, this term does not mean that Christ only appeared as a man, that he was a man, 
Flesh and blood, he possessed all the essential aspects of a human being. He bled like we bleed. He felt pain like we felt. He was tempted as we are, yet without sin. We just read that. Although he was, you know, like everybody else, he was sinless. That's, that's how he was unlike everybody else. He never sinned. He was the lamb without spot or blemish. Now, this is what I want to take a little time to talk about. Jesus was human. Many don't understand that. And, and since humans have transgressed God's law, that law claims human life as its penalty. So the word of God states in Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. Uh, 1 John 3.4 defines what sin is. Sin is the transgression of God's law, where sin is lawlessness, it says in the New King James. So if you break God's law, that's considered a sin. God made us. He made the laws to live by. You break those laws. You're sinning. What is, what is the price of sin? The wages of sin is death. So the penalty for sin is death. God the Father will not compromise. The penalty has to be paid. Jesus became a human being. So this penalty could be paid. He who is and was God actually became human flesh. That's the key. I want to read 1 John chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. 1 John 4, verses 2 and 3. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is God, is of God, sorry. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus has come in the flesh is not of God. Now, Jesus was human, but Jesus was also God. If we go to Matthew 1, verse 23, notice what we read. Behold, a virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. So if Jesus had only been human, then his death would have paid the penalty for one other human being who transgressed God's law, who broke it. And since God the Father created all things through Christ, and since all things, including man, were made by Jesus Christ, he is our maker. And therefore, God... And his life, which he gave, was of greater value than the sum total of all human beings because he made us all. He's our creator. Now, Jesus called himself the Son of Man in Scripture, and he also called himself the Son of God. Notice what it says in Matthew 16, uh, verses 15 and 16. Uh, Jesus once asked his disciples a question. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter, verse 16, Matthew 16, Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I also mentioned John 1. Let's go there for a minute. John 1, verse 1. And we'll read the first three verses. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. Drop down to verse 10. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. Verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So I hope that helps to explain uh, the background here uh, and what we have taught on that subject. Let's move on to verse 8. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. So Paul points to the external characteristics of Jesus. He, he appeared as a man. He humbled himself. He took, took on the role of a servant. And he never sinned. He became obedient to the point of death. He did not deserve to die. Uh, he, he died. He chose to die uh, so that our sins could be charged on his account and salvation would be made possible for us because it was the only way the price had to be paid. Somebody's got to pay it. And if we pay it, we're out. If he pays it, we have a chance. Paul describes here even the death of the cross, uh, the depths of Christ's humiliation by reminding all of his readers 
that Christ died the cruelest and the most brutal form of capital punishment. Uh, crucifixion is how he died. And, and that was, I mean, they use that for the worst criminals and, and Christ uh, suffered that treatment. But notice the result. Therefore, God, verse 9, has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. Christ sits at the right hand of his father at his throne in heaven right now. We know that from many verses, Romans 8.34, just one. Notice what John 17.5 says, because Christ said this, and he's getting near the end of his life. We, we again read this verse at the Passover uh, Christ said this, And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. So Christ gave that up. Christ went through the same trials, temptations, and things we do. Uh, he fasted 40 days before he was tempted by Satan. He, he, he sweat great drops of blood. Uh, you know, he knew what he was about to go through and he, he would feel the pain. Uh, and yet he was like an oak. He never sinned. He, he just didn't compromise. And as a result of that, he became that lamb that was spotless, sinless, without spot or blemish. He was the lamb of God who died for us. And the father gave his son. The son gave his life. The plan is amazing. Uh, and we should never take that for granted, what, what's been done for us. He's been given a name which is above every name. There's no other name that can be compared with, with his. It stands alone. He is the Redeemer. He is our Savior. He is the Christ, the Anointed One, the Son of God the Father himself. And his rank and his title and his dignity are above all others, and they always will be. They correspond really to his glory and majesty. And we see what he looks like in Revelation chapter 1 currently. The description of a glorified Christ with his face shining like the sun and its strength. And uh, amazing description there. Verse 10 says, at the name That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow to those in heaven and to those on earth and to those under the earth. Uh, some use the end of this verse to say, look, there is hell. It's under the earth. People are tortured down there. Uh, it's not what it says. Uh, it says every knee shall bow. bow. All knees will bow or bend uh, in honor and worship to God because that's what he is. He, he, des he deserves that. And we only kneel and bow to, to God. We don't do that to other humans. We don't even do that to angels, uh, the Bible tells us. When he talks about those in heaven, of course, the angels, uh, those other created beings at his throne, um, and he talks about, and those on earth, of course, all of us, human beings, and those under the earth, Paul refers to those who have died and uh, are in their graves. And Christ was once numbered among the dead, right? He was in the tomb for three days and three nights. It tells us that the grave couldn't hold him. Uh, the plan was that he would do that, and then he would be resurrected, and that's exactly what happened. It says, And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Everyone, every tongue, every human, every being will acknowledge him as Lord, as ruler, as sovereign, and again, that's to the glory of the Father. Verse 12, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So in order to be in the kingdom, God plainly says we've got to work at it if we want to be there. We can't drift and float along and do nothing. We've got to drive ourselves. We've got to press into the kingdom. Now, I want to continue here. Fear here is, is mentioned with fear and trembling. Fear is what? In this context, a deep awe and respect for God. That, that's what it means. Trembling with care and concern to avoid sinning and doing evil. Uh, do we have a profound reverence for God and do we cheerfully and consistently obey him in all humility? We, we should. Uh, we have a role to play. It's, but now notice verse 13. It says, For it is God who works in you both to will and to do, for his good pleasure. 
So God produces a certain effect in us, you know, through his spirit that, that dwells within us if we're baptized and have had the laying on of hands or working with us prior to that time. Through his spirit, he exerts influence on us and leads us to do what is in accordance with his will. He doesn't force us, however, against our will. We've got to yield to that lead. There's something we have to do. Uh, we've used that phrase a bunch, but pray to God and continue to row to shore is an illustration of that. We have a role to play. God set before us life and death. He said, choose life. And therefore, we have to obey God. We have to put forth the effort. If we sin, we repent. We acknowledge that. We admit it. We ask God to forgive us and wash that sin away and clean us up. Uh, but if we don't do anything, we're not going to be in God's kingdom. If we don't press hard forward and, and do the things he says, he can't use us in the kingdom. And then he tells the Philippians here, do all things without murmuring and disputing. And, and the same goes for us. Murmuring, complaining against the leaders in the church, against our fellow brethren, disputing, right? Profitless disputings with fellow Christians. This disputing stemmed often back then and yet today from vainglory and that abounded among the philosophers in Philippi. We can't let these things uh, get a grip on us. Verse 15, that you may become blameless and harmless, children of God without fault in the midst of God, without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. So to become blameless, be free from uh, defect or fault. Uh, the Philippians were to be blameless, as we are in our actions and in our words, uh, inside the church and outside the church, right? In this crooked and perverse generation, but also inside the church. Um, and then we are to shine as, shine as lights in the world. We're in a dark world, spiritually speaking, that's far from God, that sin is abounding. And you and I have been chosen to be a light in a dark world. Uh, Matthew 5, 14 through 16 talks about being a light of the world. A city is set on a hill, cannot be hidden, and, and that we should let our light shine before men. Why? That they may see our good works to glorify us. No, to glorify our Father in heaven. We bring glory to God if we're a true light. Verse 16, holding fast the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. So running suggests activity. It takes some effort. And, and Paul said, you know, the toil of his ministry, the labors of his ministry uh, would not be in vain. Yes, and if I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. So Paul had suffered much. Uh, and there was a very good possibility, if not probability, that his life might be forfeited. And he might be called to offer up his life as a sacrifice or an offering to God. And if that would happen, Paul said he wasn't going to regret it. In fact, it would be a source of joy for him. Verse 18, for the same reason, you also be glad and rejoice with me. In other words, don't grieve at my death. Don't be overwhelmed with sorrow and grief, but let your hearts be filled with congratulation. Paul felt it a privilege and an honor to die in this manner and in service to God and his church, if that's what was required. Verse 19, But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, that I also may be encouraged when I know your state. So Timothy, his name means uh, one who honors God. That's what Timothy means, one who honors God. Timothy was a servant of God. Timothy had accompanied Paul on his second missionary journey. Uh, and during that time, Paul had established the church at Philippi. And so Timothy was also well-loved by the Philippians. And he, in turn, exhibited a great concern for them. Timothy did. Uh, Paul was confident that Timothy would return with good news regarding the church at Philippi and that he would be encouraged when he knew their state. Verse 20, for I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your, your, uh, your state. So Paul and Timothy had the same like-minded concern 
and love for the Philippians. And he says, I don't have anybody that has that kind of love and concern for you above Timothy. I mean, he, he and I have that. Uh, he, he's number one. He's my first choice. For all seek their own good, not the things which are of Christ. He, he's saying, look, they, they sought their own worldly interest, their own advantage, their own ease, their own profit, their own safety. Now, his words need not be taken here as accusing all of absolute selfishness and unfaithfulness. Um, but nevertheless, they're disappointing enough. And, and, and by the way, when the trial of Paul came before the emperor uh, in Rome, his, uh, his first trial at his first defense, everybody abandoned him. And people were abandoning Paul once again because, hey, he might die and I don't want to be dead with him. Uh, he says in first, sorry, Second Timothy 4.16, At my first defense, no one stood with me, but all forsook me. May it not be charged against them. Now we got to learn from things like this and, and make sure we don't repeat this in the future. If any of God's servants end up in prison, do we abandon them? Are we scared? Are we you know, run away from them and leave them on their own? Like Paul, what happened to Paul? Verse 22, but you know his proven character, speaking of Timothy, that as a son with his father, he served with me in the gospel. Timothy's faithful character was known to the Philippians. Uh, he had spent about 10 years with Paul during his ministry. And he's like a son uh, to Paul. Uh, Paul taught Timothy personally, and, and Timothy served with Paul as a son does with his father. Uh, by the way, Timothy's father was a Greek. His mother Eunice and his grandmother Lois were Jews. And they had taught Timothy the scripture from the time he was just very young, just a kid. And we read about that in 2 Timothy 3, verses 14 and 15. Uh, we don't have time to go there. We're out of time. I'll try to wrap this up. Just a few more verses. I uh, hope you'll oblige me and we go a few minutes over here tonight. Verse 24, but I trust in the Lord that I myself shall also come shortly. Um, I'm sorry, back up to verse 23. It says, therefore, I hope to send him at once as soon as I see how it goes with me. So Paul, again, he's unsure if he'll be acquitted or condemned. But hey, look, I'll, I'm going to send Timothy. But I trust in the Lord that I myself shall also come shortly. So Paul's civil trial was coming up and he still had hope that he would be delivered. Uh, he wasn't certain of it, but he'd hoped that. And if he was released, he planned to come and visit them. Verse 25, Yet I considered it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker, fellow soldier, uh, your messenger, and the one who ministered to my need. So Epaphroditus was a Philippian Christian. He was sent by the church at Philippi to take a gift to Paul a contribution that would assist Paul in his ministry. And Paul describes him in very complimentary terms here. He says he's a brother. He's a brother in Christ. He's a fellow worker. He was engaged in the exact same work Paul was. A fellow soldier. Um, that title was given to those who had fought honorably alongside another. And Paul offered this high praise to Epaphroditus for his faithful servants in the cause of Christ. He was a fellow soldier. Uh, he was a messenger. Again, Epaphroditus was sent by the Philippians to Paul, and Paul sent him back to Phil, uh, Philippi with the epistle that, that Paul wrote to them here. Uh, he was also a minister to Paul. He ministered to Paul's needs. But during this whole process, we'll see that he fell sick. Um, notice this, verse 26, since he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. Um, Epaphroditus here demonstrated his concern for the Philippi uh, Philippians. He had the same kind of concern that Paul had for them and Timothy did. Uh, they were united in their work and in their love for the brethren there. And he knew that, Paul knew that the news of Epaphroditus' sickness had reached them, and Epaphroditus knew that it had reached them, and he realized how distressing it must have been to bear or to hear that news, we might say, that his death 
might be imminent. They may never see him again. Uh, it, it demonstrates the love of the brethren uh, that they had for Epaphroditus, that they had for one another. And do we, have, do we have that kind of love yet today? I hope we do. Verse 27, For indeed he was sick almost to death, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. So Epaphroditus had fallen sick. Paul wanted to make certain that the Philippians understood all the effort that he had put into uh, this cause for Christ, that he had come and helped Paul. But uh, the condition he had was far worse than perhaps originally noted. And God had mercy. God healed them. And, and Paul encouraged them with the good news that, uh, hey, he's all right. God healed him. And uh, Paul said, lest I have sorrow upon sorrow. Not only would Paul have lost a good friend had he died, if Epaphroditus had died, but also a fellow worker. And he would have died while trying to help Paul by doing a good thing. And that would have been more sorrow to, to lay on top of what Paul's already dealing with as a prisoner. But, uh, you know, God intervened. And anytime he does that in our life, make sure you thank him. Make sure that we don't forget that we uh, were healed and that we were near, near death and that God gave us more life. Verse 28, Therefore I sent him the more eagerly that when you see him again you may rejoice and I may be less sorrowful. So if a Epaphroditus made it back to Philippi with this epistle. Paul knew that the whole church would be encouraged by it, and he would be less sorrowful. Look, he's still in prison. He's still facing his upcoming trial, but it would have been less sorrowful knowing that they were rejoicing. Look, Epaphroditus made it through, accomplished the mission, and he's back, and now we have the, the epistle from Paul. Two more verses, 29, it says, Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness, and hold such men in esteem. He said, look, honor such men as Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus risked his life here. I mean, he almost died in service of God's apostle in accomplishing the task that he had. And he wasn't a coward. He, he was right in the middle of it and, and did what needed to be done. Verse 30, final verse, because for the work of Christ, he came close to death, not regarding his life, to supply what was lacking in your service toward me. So the, Paul informed the Philippians of the commitment that Epaphroditus had for the work that they had given him to do. Uh, Paul acknowledged that the Philippians had done a nice thing for him. Uh, and they that the Epaphroditus had been uh, physically present to aid Paul, uh, not during his the worst part of his sickness, but in, in the other part of that visit. And it's interesting that Epaphroditus and Timothy and Paul all suffered serious health issues. Uh, Timothy appeared to have some stomach problems. And that's why in 1 Timothy 5.23, uh, Paul said, No longer drink only water, but use a little wine for your stomach's sake and your frequent infirmities. So sometimes we think, look, these are powerful servants of God. They're immune to sickness and health problems. No, nope, nope, God tests and tries them. And all three of these guys suffered from pretty serious things uh, health-wise, and yet they just pressed forward and they did the work and accomplished the task that God gave them to do. All right, I know I've gone a little over. We covered a lot tonight. One more Bible study will knock out the second half of this and uh, look forward to next Friday night. Have a wonderful Sabbath. Tune in again next Friday night. Good night. For more information, go to our website at cogassembly.org. Copyright 2024, Church of God Assembly, all rights reserved.